25 years ago, I made a series of films about wine that saw me travel the world, building up into a history, which then became a book. Today, I thought I'd revisit it and cut it up into bite-sized chunks for you to view exclusively online. I hope you enjoy viewing them <laughs> as much as I enjoyed making them. After the Roman Empire disappeared, there wasn't anybody really doing anything very civilised in Europe, except the monks. And it was the monasteries that redeveloped wine and brought it to greater heights than the Romans probably ever had. In Germany, it was the hard-working Cistercian monks who established the most prosperous estates and who specialised in wine. The greatest monument to their talents and industry is the abbey they built in the Rheingau Hills in the 12th century, Kloster Eberbach. They needed wine for the daily mass, for the medical treatment they freely gave, and to entertain travellers. But most of all, they grew it for trade. In fact, the monastic orders could be described as forerunners of our modern multinational corporations. They were loyal to a system that transcended national frontiers. They swapped key personnel, they passed each other information, and they prospered. Kloster Eberbach had its own fleet of barges on the River Rhine, and it even had its own gate in the walls of the great wine trading city of Cologne. One decision that the monks took, perhaps in consultation with their colleagues in Burgundy, was to make white wine only. The red wine of the Rheingau was pale, rather pinkish in fact, and it tasted pale. So from some time, these great presses were destined to make white wine only. And the wine they set out to make was going to be as clear, limpid, and freshly fruity as possible. In fact, as different from red wine in every way. And it is delicious. Germany's greatest wine grape was identified by these great entrepreneurs, the Cistercian monks, in the Middle Ages. And once they'd discovered the Riesling, they started spreading it around in all their best vineyards. Their finest wines, kept in a separate cellar of their own, came to be known as Cabinet, now the legal term for high-quality wine of the most delicate kind. In the great church where they worshipped, is the monument to a man whose family is credited with the most significant contribution of all, the perfect German grape, the Riesling. We don't know why Count Katzenellenbogen, it means cat's elbow, gets the credit for introducing it, or just how different were the grapes it superseded. But the Riesling made, and still makes, much the best wine in the best vineyards of any grape in Germany. Above all, perhaps, in this one the Steinberg. It's the mirror image of the Clos de Vougeot, which was walled round by the brother monks of the Cistercians at their mother house of Cito in Burgundy. Now the Riesling grows here to the exclusion of all lesser grapes. True, it's a grape for the upper classes. It ripens very late in the season and it gives relatively small crops. Peasants could never afford to plant for quality rather than quantity. But the church could, the nobility could, and the rich town burghers could, and they did, with astonishing continuity. The Germans have always been great innovators in the science of wine. I went back to Germany and relived the most extraordinary tasting of my life, of a truly ancient wine. One of the great medieval discoveries of the ever-increasing German wine industry was the use of sulphur as a preservative. Its use was first officially advocated in 1487. Sulphur meant that the barrel, which was the only container they had, remember there were still no bottles, was a much safer place to keep wine. Instead of going off after a year or two, it would age for decades to greater and greater depths of flavour, which meant it was much more worthwhile, of course, to grow the very best grapes. And experience showed that the bigger the barrel, the slower the wine aged and the better it became. Simply the greater bulk meant that the air outside affected the contents more gradually. Monster barrels up to half a million litres were built to house exceptionally good vintages over many years. 
as the wine was drawn off for drinking, they were topped up with the best available new vintage, or even by dropping stones in to keep the barrel full. Preservation could be very long term. Here in the splendid cellars of the Prince Bishops of Würzburg in Bavaria, they still keep this barrel, which was built for the super vintage of 1540. It was a legend. The Rhine dried up, wine was cheaper than water, and the very best sweet wine of the vintage was put in this barrel where it stayed for 200 years, waiting, in fact, for the invention of bottles and corks. 200 years after that, the remaining bottles belonged to the Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria. And the very last bottle was opened in London in 1964. I was one of the very privileged few who were there to drink it. Incredibly, after 420 years, that wine was still alive. It was dark brown, but it was definitely Germanic in character. I was reminded of the famous opening of King Agamemnon's tomb, when the king's features, which had survived for 3,000 years intact, crumbled to dust. Within two or three minutes of opening the bottle, the wine just disintegrated. It turned to bitter vinegar. Another fabulous discovery was the extraordinary technique of making sweet wine out of rotten grapes. It was actually first hit on in Hungary in the 16th century, but the Germans were quickly onto it and before very long the French. It was probably in the Rheingau in the 18th century that lordly landowners began to experiment with selecting the ripest grapes to make sweet luxury wines. The legend goes that in 1775, the absentee bishop owner of Schloss Johannesburg, whose vines cover one of the best hills in the Rheingau, was late in sending instructions to pick the harvest. The cellar master was in despair because the grapes were rotting on the vines. When finally this dispatch rider turned up with permission to pick the grapes, they just had to make wine from grapes that were rotten. Then to their amazement, the wine they'd made was the sweetest they'd ever tasted. Spate laser, late picked, was what they called the wine, and noble rot, or edelfeuler in German, was what they called the evil-looking fungus that did it. Soon they were selecting the rotten grapes more and more carefully to make auslaser, or selected wines of honeyed sweetness and intense flavors. In no time, the new technique was picked up in Bordeaux. Above all, at Chateau Iquem in Sauterne, which could afford to make the whole of its crop as a sort of super auslaser. These grapes at Iquem are really still at an early stage of rottenness. The whole ones are still scarcely ripe, but already some are covered with a repulsive looking fungus, looking rather like little prunes. Horrible as they look, they're actually as sweet as honey. The problem is the wastage. The only way to make the nectar of Ikem is for the pickers to go round the vineyard again and again, only ever taking grapes that are fully rotten. As they rot, they shrivel, losing so much of their juice that the whole crop of a mature vine is needed to make a single glassful. Goethe, the great German poet, summed it up. Here, the rich and poor disagree. The former want the maximum quality, the latter the maximum quantity. Not all of Germany's great sweet wines are made using rotten grapes. The other way to concentrate the juices and the sweetness is to actually wait for the grapes to freeze on the vine. Can one push luxury further? The furthest extreme is quite a new, entirely German idea, ice wine. There is logic in turning the cold in these marginal vineyards to good effect. Leave the grapes on the vine, protected by plastic sheeting, until midwinter freezes them solid. Then pick them at dawn. And that's just what we're doing. This morning of New Year's Day, here in the famous doctor vineyard at Berncastel on the Moselle. This part of the vineyard belongs to Deinhardt's. And what we're doing is picking the grapes while they're actually frozen. The point of picking them when they're frozen is because the sugar in the grapes doesn't freeze, the water does. These are as hard as bullets. But when they're pressed and made into wine, the sugar is separate from the water. You throw the water away and you get the quintessential sweet German wine. You make very, very little of it, but it lasts forever and it costs a fortune.